Vegas. <laughs> Well, I want to thank you all for joining us today. I'm very excited about this conversation. My name is Elaine Shea. I am the Client and Community Engagement Manager at 52 Limited, which is a creative and tech staffing agency local here to Portland. Um, I have the wonderful, wonderful honor to um, have this great discussion with some local leaders here in the Portland market to talk about building company culture from afar. Um, as we all know, we have been living through a pandemic for the last year and a half, almost two years. And um, this has definitely impacted the way we work, um, the way that our um, companies work together, and the way that we attract talent. Um, so I'm really excited to um, have this discussion and see kind of where everybody is you know, how they're doing it and, and some best practices. And as much as I know that um, the pandemic is not permanent, neither are these answers, right? Um, onboarding, um, company culture is consistently changing. It's iterative. And so um, it's just going to be so delightful to hear from each one of you how you're tackling it, how you kind of just, you know, how you've decided to, you um, be in the space and how you're going to move forward. So I want to give um, Kristen the opportunity to introduce yourself, talk a little bit about Edify and what, what you do at Edify. Yeah, thank you, Elaine. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here in this conversation. Um, so my name is Kristen Buchanan. I am the founder and CEO of a company called Edify. Uh, we're a fully distributed company. We're about 10 people and we make software to support developer enablement. We first build en engineering onboarding software and knowledge management tooling. And I've been in this space of uh, onboarding and knowledge management and um, adjacently company culture and how people communicate for the last seven, eight years. I have a background in adult learning and um, how adults learn in non-traditional environments, uh, which is what led me to, to building companies in this space. Um, so that's going to be kind of my perspective today. Excellent. Thank you. Doug? Hi, I'm Doug Westervelt. I'm uh, the CEO of Portland Internetworks. We're about 35 folks uh, who've been in business for about 25 years providing managed technology services, mostly to small and medium-sized business. business. We do um, like outsource IT management strategy security on a fixed monthly basis and also get engaged uh, on lifetime materials and uh, project basis here and there as well. We're also a B Corporation, um, certified B Corp. So that just means that we um, are equally committed in people planet as well as profit. Um, and we kind of got into this culture space as uh, trying to answer the hard question of how do we retain our really key people in an environment where tech people are in demand for people who can write almost like limitless checks that so we've got to bring something else to the table um, other than just being like, buddies with all of our workers, we need to bring something compelling and interesting that, you know, just doesn't have a number on it. Thank you. Chris? Hi, um, I'm Chris Gray, and I'm the uh, CEO of Run AMZ. Um, we're a sales management agency, and we specialize in helping consumer products band, uh, brands on Amazon, as well as walmart.com. So, um, you know, we market, I manage marketplace services, everything from digital merchandising to advertising, um, you know, promotional planning on those uh, on those platforms. And uh, yeah, we compete in a very um, fast growing and competitive space on the Amazon side and excited to bring some perspective of we, what we've learned uh, throughout the last year and a half since the pandemic started. Um, before we talk about, you know, what we've done during the pandemic and how we've kind of pivoted and shifted, let's talk about what you know, um, your company culture was like, what the work style was like before the pandemic. Chris, why don't you go ahead and start? Yeah, so before the pandemic, we were a small company. You know, there was uh, 10 of us when we started. It was very tight knit. Um, it was very um, organic in the way we did work. It wasn't super well formalized and we were 100% in office as well. So um, that's kind of how we started. And then during the pandemic, we honestly grew to about 30 um, and most of that growth of, you know, 20 people came in those first couple months. So um, certainly a challenge, right, in those first months of the pandemic to be bringing new people on, looking for talent, and then trying to onboard in that space. And what was your kind of work, I mean, what was your culture like? Was it when you when you onboarded new talent before the pandemic? Was it, did you tell your potential hirees, you know, it's 100% in office? Was there already a hybrid model there? 
Yeah, no, when we started, we were 100% in office. So we were all in office every day. Um, you know, we might have had a 10% kind of work from home uh, environment, but it was it was primarily an in office, um, working together every day sort of, uh, sort of company. And everybody's Portland based? Everybody was Portland based at that time. Mm -hmm. I see. And, and Doug, you're the same way, correct? Portland Internet Works is also Portland based, everyone in the office? Yeah, uh, I think probably our radius is stretched out a few more miles, but um, pretty much everybody is in Portland. Everybody was in the office, really like full court press, you know, cheek, not literally cheek to jowl, but um, we very much leaned into that we are all in sharing the same space and getting to know each other on a very like non-verbal, non-virtual way. And what would you say that your company culture was like based on that type of work style? Um, fun and like informal, um, very kind of flat organization, um, very like it, it has always been a concerted effort for us to make sure that people get to know each other on a level that's not just sort of like sending memos or emails back and forth, really to kind of get under the surface and understand what makes them tick as a person, even outside of the office. And Kristen, I know that this is completely different than the way <laughs> Edify, which is why I think this conversation is so unique, right? Because we have such varying um, approaches to the way that we work and how we build company culture. So tell me um, what it was like before the pandemic. Yeah, so Edify was, um, was started before the pandemic, but not, we weren't actually bringing in employees at that time. So, um, Edify kind of officially started probably three months prior to shutdown in, in 2020. And, you know, I had run my first business remote. i had had remote employees, um, who happened to be Portland based as well. But, um, in that time, in that business, we would um, occasionally rent a co-working space for a day and do brainstorming sessions. We were also going on site with clients a lot. So we were seeing each other in person a lot. With this company, um, I knew that, you know, pre-pandemic, pre pandemic, pardon me, um, had a hiccup in there. Um, you know, I knew I wanted a remote company because I was kind of joke, I think it would be gauche if the CEO didn't come into the office. And I'm not an office person. Um, lots of people are because they like to be around people. I'm a very focused person. I, I need kind of quiet. I like my office to be very specifically set up. Um, and so I've never really thrived in an office, but a lot of people do. And a lot of cultures do thrive in an office. But now that we are 10 people, I've got nine other employees in my, in my team. We have people, um, a lot of people in Portland, but also all over the country, Mm -hmm. um, we've got somebody in Arkansas, we have somebody in uh, the Philippines, we have somebody, two people in California. Um, so we are, we're really thinking about how are we building a culture where we can't always see each other. Now, we actually were, we lucky enough just this past week, um, our CTO and product designer came up from California to be with us a couple of days last week. Um, all the developers were able to be together for an offsite Monday and Tuesday of this week. Um, and, you know, COVID has made it hard to get in together in person. You have to kind of be more um, gentle and specific with people about how, how are you feeling comfortable? Are you feeling comfortable? Um, and I think it's really important not to push, not to press people, um, because it's, you know, people aren't ready to explain why they're not comfortable, right? Or why they are comfortable, right? Um, Edify really operates on this sort of consent-driven communication model. And so um, we were able to find out that people were comfortable in that. And so we could plan um, some small kind of group offsites, even within our 10-person company. Um, so that was really, really helpful for us. But our culture has really developed as a remote first company. And I think I would describe us as fun. We have a morning GIF culture where we're always in Slack um, sharing a GIF about how we're feeling that day or what's going on with the weather that day, uh, wherever we are. Um, and it's we, we have, you know, monthly team hangouts where we're playing a game. Last, last month, it was Princess Bride trivia. Um, as it turns out, one of our team members is really into Princess Bride and like really killed it <laughs> on, the, on the trivia there. Um, and, you know, things like that has, have really helped us keep connected. Um, but on the flip side, you know, we're also hearing from some of our new employees um, over the past six months that they came to Edify because they wanted that flexibility. They didn't want to go back into an office. And so I think to some extent for us, it's been a self-selecting group um, of different people who want different things. It doesn't mean that one way is better than the other. 
Kristen, as we kind of shift, you know, fingers crossed that, you know, the numbers come down low, children get vaccinated, um, you know, we're able to travel about more freely. Do you think that you will change the way that your work model is now? Do you think that coming into a new normal will alter the culture that you have created? No, I don't think so. I think people who work at Edify, from what they've told me, from when I'm listening to them, asking them what they think about our culture, what we should change, what we should keep, um, they like this model. They like being able to flex. Um, I think what might change is that we could do more elaborate offsites, right? We could actually take people to a particular place for a week or so, um, have some fun, have some focus, work on some strategy. Um, I'd love to be doing that, you know, once or twice a year with the whole team as we get larger and as it gets more, you know, um, reliable and safe to do that. But I don't anticipate that we're going to have an office. I think what might change as, as our business gets bigger and, and more successful, we might start doing um, larger remote office stipends. We already do make sure that all of our team members have the physical setup that they need. So we do offer some reimbursements for the right desk equipment. We make sure you have the right monitor, keyboard, microphone, ring light, all of those things um, that, that make sure that this is an ergonomic working space for you. But we do know that a lot of folks are working out of their dining room or they're working out of their basement and those things may not be ideal for them. And we can't prescribe for them what is the best way to design their office. So we may be able to offer more reimbursement to help them design that office the way they want to. Thank you. What about you, Doug? How, how being is that, you know, before the pandemic, it was very Portland in person now without being able to do so, how, what, what things have you done at Portland internet works to kind of accommodate that culture while being remote? Sure. So we have um, always like from day one, you know, when this was just going to be a few weeks, right. Um, we had said like, Hey, we're going to be back to the way we were in 2019 or in last January or whatnot. Um, so everything has been with that idea that we'll be back to what we were before. And maybe that makes me an old dog, new, no, new tricks or you know, a traditionalist or whatnot. But up until that date, we had been very um, heavy in what our, our, like our cultural branding was about. Like these, we brought in these people that wanted that type of experience. We really um, emphasize that experience and we've been trying to iterate and, and improve on that all the time. So, um, so consequently, we have a lot of people who are feeling that they want to go that way. And, and Kristen mentioned like self-selecting, you know, we love it um, when we have a, say a job candidate that comes to us and says, you know, Hey, I'm really looking for something that's more like a remote experience, or I can, you know, work on a flexible basis. Like, great. You're going to be awesome somewhere else. And that does <laughs> not a judgment. Um, it's great because it just means that they, now we've delineated rather than sort of everybody's fighting over the same people. Um, we're able to find a better happy place for the candidates that are coming through the process. So that's great. Um, so with respect to the things that we've been doing between you know then and now is a lot of the things that we're doing for our, our team are very sort of, um, their proxies are they are representative of what we expect to see after this is all over. So um, just as an example, tonight we're doing a virtual B movie bingo because before we had been doing that, um, we've got a giant white wall in our office and we project it and we have a big pizza party and everybody brings their friends and spouses and you know, whatnot. Um, so we're just doing a virtual event um, that is as close to that as possible, just using some technology stuff. But, um, you know, because we're always trying to mix that physical and virtual reality. Um, we put together some like real world gift goodie bags um, that people have been picking up in the office. And it's got a bunch of, you know, popcorn and beer and that sort of thing that they can then take with them. And so they'll feel more engaged and more attached as if, it, as if it's a more real experience for them. So that's kind of an example. No, that's a great example. And I know that before the pandemic, you used to have a company camping trip. And that was something that you embarked on this summer as well, making yeah. sure that people were safe, but still having that experience. Yeah. Um, for those people that are kind of, you know, trying to hone in on those kinds of practices, do you have one or a team or people that are dedicated to ensuring that that, that, that experience is um, A, pivoted into the virtual and safe? Do you, do you have someone that's dedicated to that? Do you work as a leadership team? How does that workflow happen? 
Yeah, we actually have a culture team in in the office, and that the the representation, the makeup of that team changes over time. Partly as people get interested, or they like they're busy on other things. But the idea is to kind of perpetuate what our culture is, whether it's in a virtual or real uh, real world. Um, and you know, if it was left up to me, I'd probably just be stomping my feet saying, "This isn't fair. Why do we have to do this?" Um, but we have some really great creative folks that you know are living and breathing kind of what it is that we're trying to do. And they come up with amazing, great ideas. And you know, often if, if we're not having a conversation about the pandemic, we're just talking about company culture. You know, you can lead from the top what it is that you want to define as your company culture, but really it takes everybody else perpetuating it and growing and expanding and improving on it. And those are some of the happiest times where I look at and think like I wasn't involved in any of this, like these recent ad adaptations. Um, but these amazing things are happening, and they're bringing people together, and they're feeling really good. And the folks that have that have started up with us in, during the pandemic, they have a really good vision of what it's going to look like after when they're working here. And the people that worked here before the pandemic, they're seeing like that whole legacy continue to live on with the hope that, you know, we'll be back to where we are sooner than later. Thank you. Chris, as, as your company grew during the pandemic, did you find that your culture was kind of recreated or, or, or is your culture kind of that the same as Doug's? Is it kind of you're just pivoting your culture to match the state in which we're in? Tell us a little bit more about kind of what Run AMZ has done. Yeah, so, you know, Run AMZ, you know, from this really tight knit culture, this really group of friends that were working towards a, a common goal. Um, you know, we were all in office and we we did make the decision as we grew to, uh, you know, to go full remote. So we made that decision in, uh, gosh, February of 2021. And honestly, that was driven by um, a couple a couple factors. One, it was a, a, a really scarcity of talent for what we do. So we realized really quick with scale, um, we you know needed to go find folks that were outside of Portland and, and give them a way to still connect to to our company and be part of what we're doing. But we needed to be willing to let them live uh, elsewhere. Um, and partially because of you know the competitive environment, there was a lot of folks from our team that got used to to working remote. They enjoyed working remote, and uh, and a lot of our competitors were offering that. So we we knew that we needed to flex and adapt to uh, to be able to offer that you know ongoing. So. Um, one thing is we do still hold an office, so about two thirds of our team are still in Portland, with a third being dispersed. So we do hold an office space, and we will continue to do that most likely uh, to give people a place to come and connect in person. I think it's it's really important for uh, you know people working uh, for us to get to know each other as as human beings, not just you know the the face on the screen. So we want to facilitate that. So over the uh, um, over the course of the last year, you know, similar to Doug, we actually implemented a, a culture committee um, that actually rotates quarterly for us. So we get, you know, lots of different people an opportunity to speak into, you know, how we connect, what does that look like? And, and honestly, it gives a lot of different perspectives on what people need. And I think that's a big learning from us is that what people need in this space uh, can vary drastically person to person. Um, so we just need to be central to, you know, who we are as a business, what we do as a business, but the, the needs of the individuals, oftentimes more perspectives about what people are looking for um, is really, really important. So yeah, the culture committee is, is there to um, find opportunities for us to connect. Um, you know, there's a, a weekly kind of coffee time that everybody can, can go to and just, you know, hang out and talk about life. Um, little things that we started to do, we started to start our, our uh, staff meetings 15 minutes early. And the first 15 minutes is more of just a, a time to, uh, you know, to connect a little bit and kind of creates more of that, you know, everybody gathering in an office uh, or a, a conference room kind of feeling. Um, you know, we also implemented a lot more um, opportunities for people to connect, even via Slack or different technologies, you know, opening different channels for people to talk about things other than work and, uh, and, and try to understand who their coworkers are. Um, and then there's really a, a core group of folks that have, that have been with us the entire time as we've kind of grown and we're a fairly young company. You know, we're, we're really four years old. Um, and I think the, the leadership of those individuals and really perpetuating our culture as far as how we do what we do, why we do what we do, and how we care for the people that, uh, that we work with is, uh, has been really vital to kind of being able to, um, you know, continue on in the culture that we had. And, you know, I would be the first to admit, I felt like there was this, this kind of dip in the, the quality of our culture as uh, the pandemic started and we onboarded a lot of new people. Um, you know, a lot of, it was essentially at one point, a lot of strangers working together because nobody had met. And there was folks that um, honestly, like I think still a third of our team has never met the, anybody else from our team in person. 
So that was a real a real challenging time for us, and I felt like it took us uh, honestly through a couple a uh, couple quarters of 2021 before we really started to regain the foothold of of that culture that we're still trying to perpetuate. Running AMZ is is unique in that it is a creative but yet digitally um, enhanced, right? It's you kind of got both sides of it. Um, and anecdotally, creatives tend to be creative in a space together, right? Having those sidebar conversations, the meeting after the meeting, um, whiteboarding and things like that. Whereas tech tends to sometimes be, I don't want to be too stereotypical or generalized, you know, more isolated in kind of the work that they do. Chris, being is that you're the CEO of this company that kind of straddles both. I heard you mention Slack. Are there other um, technologies, programs, platforms that you're using to kind of um, accelerate that creativity that they're missing from not being in the office or never having missing, miss, met each other? Are you using other types of tools to create those types of engagements? Yeah, you know, I think we did a couple things. And, and one was realizing that we, we went from being fairly informal as a business and in, in the way that we do things, not a lot of processes, um, and realizing that in the remote, larger environment, that just wasn't going to work. Um, so I, I'm not sure if it perpetuates the creativity as much as it perpetuates um, effective work together as we implemented a, a project management software. So, I mean, we use Asana just as something that was much more robust in ways to know what each other are doing. Um, we also uh, got much more strict about time tracking, which might sound a little counterintuitive because everybody hates it, but it was such a good window into um, not like individual performance, but where are we as a business, where are we stressing people too much and where do people maybe have a little bit of additional space to, uh, to take on some of, some of the, the workload. Um, Slack is, is key to what we do on a, you know, on a daily basis. It's our, our primary form of communication. Um, and I would say we're also a little bit old school in that, I mean, I say like, like pick up the phone. If you're going to be slacking back and forth, especially in this remote environment, we're really big on talk to people um, because I think there's so much, um, you know, communication that's missed in writing. And, and we do so much of that that we really do focus on, you know, being on the phone. We focus on, you know, having our cameras on when we are, we are in Zoom meetings so that we can uh, more effectively communicate, more effectively engage with, uh, with others. Um, you know, other things that we do in, in that space is we, we've kind of broken up our, our team into smaller pods that work really closely together so that you can kind of get some of that, uh, you know, that intimacy with the team that you, you miss as, as you grow. Um, and, and those teams have, um, you know, had, had leaders that are kind of building them up into, into their own separate units as well that, that connect a lot, which, is, which has really been positive for us. Thank you. Doug, do you use Slack? What do you, do you use any other ways to, you know, um, either engage with one another or to, you know, further work streams or using some secret technology that we, the rest of us may not know about? Sure. Well, I can say we were a part of the Slack cult before it was, before it was cool. Um, no, we, we've been big slackers. That sounds wrong. We've been heavy <laughs> into Slack for so many years and, um, and, and, you know, we always kind of couched it in terms of like in our business, because we're supporting other people's technology, we need to have the best technology and we need to be more advanced in it so that if something happens, you know, we used to think of things like, okay, well, what if there's an ice storm or there's a snow day, we need to be able to, you know, operate immediately um, as if there, we were in the office. So at least on a temporary basis. Um, so we had a lot of that technology built up. We did say some things early on, which was that, you know, we'll have no calls that are just audio. If we're having a meeting, everybody's cameras are on at all times. Um, that sort of thing. And it didn't mean to be draconian. It was just to sort of like, we want to capture all the communication that we possibly can in the time that we have to do it. Um, I think our secret superpower in terms of, you know, how do we keep people engaged in this environment is honestly really old school. We throw in as much real world as we possibly can. Um, you know, even when, you know, if it went at the most distant that everybody was, you know, we're doing drive-bys, we're dropping off um, goodie bags and packages with people. Um, you know, doing whatever we could to, you know, both follow the letter and intent of the guidance, but also to not, not use that as an excuse to not connect with people on a human eyeball to eyeball basis. So, um, you know, we've probably done a lot more physical world things, whether it's sending home packages or, you know, having, you know, we've done things like crazy meetings out in dog parks where, you know, there's a bunch of distance between each other, um, whatever it took to like, 
really maintain that human to human um, bond. So uh, it, I don't know if it, it applies in all cases and I don't know if it's really that relevant for folks, but it, it's been something that's helped us, us kind of preserve uh, as we've, as this kind of goes on and on. Sure. Sure. Kristen, what about you? You're, 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 you know, a software company. So are you using Slack? Or are you finding other ways to engage with, you know, your remote workforce? Absolutely. Yeah. I think there's, there is a host of tools and I can get into some of that, but I also just love, um, especially, you know, what Doug is talking about that there people are people, right? Like we should re remember that humans are humans and um, from a biological perspective, we like to connect with other humans in person. Um, and for a lot of people actually understanding your body language, being able to see in person, connect in person is really important. Um, even for me, even the introvert who likes to be in her own office. Um, and so it's been really fulfilling for us when we can do kind of one-on-one -on -one co-working days where one of us will come to the other one's house. Um, I don't live in Portland anymore, but sometimes I'll drive down to, to hang out with a particular coworker um, or trade off, try to be around in a co-working space every now and then. Um, and we also, I love the physical connection idea, the gifts, things like that. We always do an onboarding package for people. Um, and we also try, you know, this isn't really, it's tech enabled, but we try to do team lunches and, and make sure that we're rewarding really hard work weeks, things like that with a lunch or a dinner, um, things like that. I think that, you know, when we can't share a meal together, letting somebody know that we see you, we, we appreciate the work that you've done is really important on the tech side of the house. Um, there are different tools that we use for connecting ourselves and really working through asynchronous communication because we do have many different time zones. Um, we keep all of our documentation on a platform called Notion. Uh, we use Zoom a lot, obvious, <laughs> Slack, obvious. Um, but our development team actually really likes a tool called Gather, which is kind of like a cross between Minecraft and The Sims. Um, it happens to be free, at least right now. <laughs> and um, they kind of hang out in there and they have sort of a, a digital room, a conference room that they can actually whiteboard in and, and be together in um, and kind of pair program while they're apart from one another. Um, so they really enjoy that. And that's been helpful. Sometimes will other people outside the dev team will step into that and enjoy that. Um, and I think when we're having kind of team fun, team social times, we look for other interesting platforms. Um, we have used uh, different game platforms that come through gather, gather to play fishbowl or charades or things like that. Um, for one of our things, actually in one of our, our earlier retreats this year that was digital, um, we actually hired a company that's called Kingmakers and they um, played a board game. Uh, that, I don't know how to describe it, but it was a real life physical board game that they had a camera on. And then each of us had our own kind of cards to keep track of our um, our scores in it. And that was really fun. I was actually kind of nervous about it because it was like, I don't know, are they just going to take camera, you know, a, a picture of the thing? Um, but it's uh, it was actually really fun and, and we enjoyed it a lot. Um, so I think that constantly being aware of what some of these other tools are, uh, what, what's coming up. Um, the one that I also really like is Miro. There's a bunch of different whiteboarding tools. Miro is one. Miro is one that we happen to like. Um, and Miro is great for actually being together in collaboration. So we're not always looking at each other's faces on Zoom, but we're looking at the shared whiteboard and what each other are writing, post-its that we're putting up, things like that. Yeah, I've used Miro. It's it's very helpful. It, you know, for those of us that like post-it notes and write, you know, and just being able to free flow some of those thoughts mm -hmm. and having some type of collaboration ideation um, opportunities. Um, got a couple shout outs about Gather. It looks okay. like uh, it is being used currently for um, Cascadia JS's virtual mm -hmm. conference and it's new to Sheila, so she's really excited about it. What I like about Gather is that there's that freedom of choice, right? You can enter a room, you can leave the room. Um, if you pay for the version of, you know, you can brand it, you can put up things, um, where sometimes Zoom can be kind of flat. So depending on the size of your company, you can um, choose to have that different type of experience. Um, Something that we, you know, also heard anecdotally is that um, productivity while people are working remotely is flat or down. 
Mm -hmm. um, and, and I don't know that if that's true. I don't know if, you know, as much time can be spent talking at the microwave while you're warming up your lunch is the same as if you were to unload your dishes while you're at home. Um, how do you kind of suss that out? I mean, I know it's kind of, you don't want to be big brother, right? You can't monitor someone at all times. Um, Chris, are you finding that your new remote team is less productive, more productive? Is it basically project-based? Like, how do you kind of gauge that and make sure that you're tempering it to the right and appropriate amount? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a, it's been a, a real challenge is to really identify that and to, to do it honestly and not off of, you know, kind of gut reactions of what's happening. So um, it, from what we've seen through, you know, time tracking, we try to stay really connected with the individuals that are working on the team to see what they're, you know, what they're saying and, and how they're feeling. So I think that matters a ton, too. Um, what we've seen is a select number of people work way too much. And, uh, and almost unhealthfully so, and a select number of people um, maybe become a little bit less efficient. So I think that's that's kind of the, the general gist of what I've seen is, is it kind of, um, and there's, a, of course, a lot of people in the middle. Uh, so I, I don't know if we're less efficient or less effective, uh, but we've really tried to measure people on strictly on their output um, and the quality of their work um, above all else. And then a lot of the, you know, is that happening in an efficient way is kind of a, a bigger conversation for, for the, uh, you know, for the individual or the manager. Um, Cause I do think it's the, the natural tendency to want to say, Hey, I'm really, really busy. I'm really, really busy. Um, and so we want to kind of temper that and say, okay, if you're really, really busy, how do we fix that? Because we don't want you to burn out. And on the flip side, how do we not make it just a, a culture of saying you're busy because that's the right thing to do? So, um, yeah, it's really trying to measure on, on output, um, you know, what is the, the productivity of, of what they're, they're bringing to the table, um, chatting with them. And then our time tracking tool has been really effective in that because we can see where the time is going and at times – help folks um, kind of coach them on, on how to be more efficient with a little bit of, uh, of data behind what we're doing, um, as opposed to just gut feelings and reactions over, you know, how much they're communicating and when they're communicating and things like that. So those, I guess that's a little bit of our approach to it and how we've, uh, how we've seen it play out. Um, yeah. Kristen, you have a team that is, um, has different time zones. So how do you kind of balance that and make sure that people are getting what they need? And this is a problem that, you know, not a problem, but this has been a challenge for companies even before the pandemic, right? Working in different time um, zones. How do you kind of ensure that teams are getting what they want when they need it in an appropriate amount of time? Yeah, yeah. I'll get, get there in just a minute. I think, you know, for us, the key has been looking at productivity um, less in terms of uh, some specificity around how much you're working or how you are working or where you're showing up, how many meetings you're coming to, and actually more about the outcomes that you are achieving and getting really, really clear, really forcing ourselves to get very specific about the outcome and then get really divorced from how you do that work, right? For example, we have a lot of parents on our team. And um, one of the things that I think is, you know, we're kind of mixing variables here with COVID, right? We can say, oh, remote work is down, you know, or um, remote work has, a, has some kind of impact on productivity, but that is sort of forgetting the kind of general anxiety and stress of the last 18 plus months. And the reality that lots of working parents have left the, the workforce, the reality that um, services and support that were available to people, parents or otherwise, are not available to people. Um, not to mention just the emotional strain of having to think through, how am I going to behave? How am I going to operate in a, this sort of new normal that we have? Um, and it, it's not like it has gone away. It's if, if not more complex today than it was in March of last year. And so, um, as I said earlier, humans are humans and you cannot expect them to come to work sort of fresh slate, clean of every sort of stressor in their life. And so being focused on outcomes has allowed us to make space for people's lives, right? To make space for um, the fact that, you know, somebody might come into work and, be extremely distracted because of something that's happening in their personal life, but know that they would be more productive between 6 and 9 p.m. tonight, and that's going to be better for them. So whether or not you're on a different time zone, getting to the original question, 
you know, really stressing, this is our goal. This is what we're trying to accomplish. Not only is this our North Star for a company for this quarter or for this year, but what this project is trying to accomplish is this. Um, just be in communication with us about what you need, how you need help, how you need um, information to achieve what you need. Um, and the other side of that is making sure that we do document things. One of the other tools that we use and this is sort of a better place for this um, is Loom. So we do a lot of Loom videos, you know, some instead of a meeting where somebody's like, oh, could we talk about that? It's like, just record a five minute Loom video and explain to me what your concern is about that. And instead of having a 30 minute conversation, we can just get this done in seven minutes. So it's not that we don't want to connect with one another. It's that people's lives are different and unpredictable. And sometimes it's better to connect in person or on a Zoom or on a phone call, um, but other times it may not be the best thing to do that. That's a new one. I haven't heard, heard of that technology. I'll have to check that out. I find that very intriguing. It's a, it's almost like a video message, right? Instead it is. It's exactly a video. And it's great because we can share our screen and say, this is the part on the website that I don't like anymore. Let's change that. Here's the language from the product positioning doc. Change that over here. Um, and that's all that needed to be done, right, was getting that message to the web designer, right, <laughs> rather than me booking time with the web designer, and it couldn't be today because he's busy, right, um, when he can just review that three-minute video, and it's easy peasy. Yeah, I like that. I want to go back to something that Doug had mentioned about meetings and Zoom and, and, and the, and the on-camera. Doug, do you tell your staff, like, it's, it's known? Is it known that, like, your video camera is on? Um, do you set a cadence of meetings? I think that that's something that as we go into the new normal, you know, um, people get burned out on, on video calls and on Zoom, especially if they're on it all day. But if there's the expectation is already set, that kind of helps manage, you know, people's day and kind of how they navigate that. Do you do that for all of your meetings? Tell us a little bit more about how you set that cadence. Yeah, so I think, you know, before pandemic, we still had a cadence of various meetings. This one, this group gets together every couple of weeks, one-on-ones or, you know, whatever their intervals are, that sort of thing. And I think we had the ability to be a little bit loose about it. Like, hey, this person is busy working on a project. Let's push it to tomorrow or let's skip this week and move on to next week, that kind of thing. I think um, both in terms of engagement and also for that ability for conversations that maybe don't warrant, you know, their own specific Loom call or a video conference or whatnot. We really wanna have the opportunity for people to have that sort of ad hoc communication. Hey, while we're talking about this, this is something small that came up and I just wanna ask you about it, that type of thing. Or if somebody's kind of, you know, there's something that's grinding in their gears and they wanna get it off their chest, but they don't wanna like elevate it to the level like, hey, can we have a discussion about this? So um, I, I think it's a forced us to be a little bit, well, actually a lot more um, diligent in about you know, that meetings are not just about us trying to convey one to many sort of what's happening or what's coming down the road. It's an opportunity for feedback to come both directions. So um, so with respect to meetings, you know, are we having more or less of them than them? I mean, one observation is that you just, the, due to the nature of it, like, and I'm sure we'll, all of us on this call will experience it, you know, we'll have something that starts at one o'clock or 101 right after this call, right? So that sort of like natural, like wind down of a meeting and the wind up of the next meeting, you know, as you might have been normally walking from one side of the building to the other, or somebody says, I'm going to duck into the restroom for a minute. That seems to be gone. And I, I think that, that that stress of that changing context from one to the other, um, as much as we have to do in the day, in a day now, I think that's probably causing a lot of stress and anxiety for folks. So um, we've had a lot of people, you know, the nature of our company and our maybe homogenous group of, of uh, social interactors uh, that they want it to have that face-to-face -face interaction. But many of them are like, hey, I'm not ready to do this either from a health and safety perspective or maybe from childcare or, you know, whatever it is. So they're say, well, I can do it a few days a week until things kind of settle down. So what we've tried to do, um, you know, while keeping everything, you know, safe and effective is let's coordinate the times that we're going to be together, even if it's only a couple of days a week, so that we can have as many of those like face-to-face -face interactions as possible on the days that we're all here. No sense in somebody saying, I'm going to come into the office you know, on Tuesday when nobody else is in the office, right? So, um, so we're doing a better job of coordinating, you know, how intentional those conversations are happening. Um, rather than maybe just assuming that everything's fine. Does that make sense? Totally, totally. Chris, 
what what lessons would you say that you have really learned during this pandemic and building culture and working remotely? And what advice would you give to someone who is in this space or who who is kind of, I mean, none of us have a crystal ball. I don't think that anyone would have guessed that, you know, flattening the curve would take this long or you know, <laughs> continue to be flattening or however you want to put it. But for those people who are, you know, thinking about their next steps and how they're going to um, pick the company back up and make it as brilliant as it was before, what advice and what lessons would you share? Yeah, it's an interesting question. I, I feel like the biggest lesson for me in this whole process is just how different people have reacted to this situation and how everybody is so unique and what they need to uh, be and feel successful in the company. Um, and I think that's been, you know, that's been a, a real challenge. And um, so I think we've had to be much more intentional and, and are becoming much more intentional about, okay, you know, who are the different groups and what do they need in our company to, uh, you know, to make them feel a part of our culture, to make them feel connected, um, to make them feel encouraged and good at their jobs. Um, you know, all those things are, are very unique and that, that, also, it's uh, it's not enough to model anymore. I guess that's the other big piece of the remote uh, the remote environment that that I've learned a lot about is it was very easy with a small team to just charge forward and say, hey, you know, follow me, let's go. This is kind of how we're going to do things, and people tend to pick up on that. And then the, the culture is at that point self perpetuating uh, because people are seeing and interacting in a much more direct way with with you know what that group is charging forward with. New people come on on board and they kind of intrinsically understand it. And I feel like that is um, that is very much gone. I think it's much more difficult in the digital space to just kind of the, the lead by example uh, piece. And so you have to be much more intentional with, uh, you know, with how you approach this, you know, kind of this, this culture, um, you know, the, the culture topic and what do you want your business to be? It's going to take intentional steps. It's going to take work. Um, and I think that's, that's different for, for me over the last, uh, you know, over the last couple of years and even very different in other leadership that I've had in the past. So um, as far as advice, yeah, be intentional, listen. Um, that's, that's a lesson that I've, I've learned a lot is like, listen to what other people are needing and then um, be prepared to dedicate time and effort to it. I appreciate that. That seeing is doing is kind of harder in this model when we can't see each other for sure. Kristen, what about you? And CRI did see your question and I'm going to take some audience questions in just a few moments. So um, we'll definitely get to that. But beforehand, Kristen, please, any lessons learned, advice you could share? Yeah. I mean, I think my, my biggest piece of advice is to recognize that um, people are different in what they like, what they need, what they expect. And I see a lot of sort of like religious wars around, you know, hybrid is going to be the way or in office is the only way or remote is the only way. Um, I just think it's, it's very silly, honestly. <laughs> um, you know, the, the reality has been um, sort of truthfully that we have used offices to control people. We have used them in the past to make it easier for us to physically see that they are doing work. And when you can divorce yourself from needing to see, to trust, right? And, and start living in, I just trust that my employees are doing the work that we have agreed mutually that they should do because we are clear on the expectations and the goals, you can be much less stressed out as a, a business owner or a leader, manager, et cetera. I used to work with engineering managers who and leaders who would say, I could never possibly let my eng team be remote, right? And as it's turned out, um, some of the more recent kind of studies from engineering teams has shown that a lot of engineers are really just happier this way. They're happier humans. And what happier humans do is that they tend to be more productive, right? Um, that there are different Venn diagrams of types of people that have different types of jobs that want different kinds of things and, and at different stages in their lives, right? Um, and so I think having that flexibility and as Chris mentioned, you know, constantly listening and asking, I think every business owners should balance the kind of asking that you do as long as you um, intend to do something with whatever you learn, right? There's sort of the, um, the hazard of asking and doing surveys and not actually doing anything with any of the feedback that you learn. Um, so I think that is really important to pay attention to that, you know, help your employees understand what you can do um, and what, what things can change, 
um, that fit within your budget, fit within your, you know, your culture, um, the things that you're willing to change and things that you can't for any particular reason, um, because it, it's not necessarily, um, you know, at the, at the end of the day, you're still running a business and it still has fiduciary responsibilities um, or responsibilities in other realms like a B Corp. And so you have to be clear about what, what can happen. But I think just getting comfortable with that idea that people don't have to be in an office to be productive. And it's more about the trust and the outcomes. Thank you, Kristen. Doug? I love it. I'm going to springboard off of both of my colleagues here, which is, <laughs> uh, I, I was thinking, you know, key word is really intention, intentional and, and outcomes. And then, you know, sort of the, the idea of like, a you know, hybrid is going to be the way and everybody's going to work in an office. You know, what's kind of cool about it is all of that is true. For some people, you know, remote is the future. What's really great is by being intentional. It's kind of like, know your room, know your audience, know your strengths, right? What I think is, is great about this is it's giving the opportunity, it's kind of forcing the opportunity to be for people to be very upfront and transparent with what it is that they want and how they better work and how they, you know, they work together. So, um, you know, we now sort of have that strength and that responsibility to say like, hey, we are a very in-person, in-office, kind of in front of the customer, physicality type of company that might've been either, well, Captain Obvious or awkward or weird, you know, three years ago. But now we can say that because it's very important for our candidate or our current teammate to know exactly how we stand because they've got options, we've got options. We want everybody to be in an environment that that works for them. You know, it's like any relationship. If you're sort of guessing at what the other person wants, you know, sometimes that works out. Most of the times it doesn't, and it's painful to finally get there. But if people are very upfront about what what they like and what's important to them and what their priorities are, then at least you have a much stronger foundation for at least understanding your, your, each other at that level. Um, and I'm excited about that. I think that that is going to allow people to, whether self-select or to, to find what it is that they think is going to be um, workable for their particular situation. I think we're going to have a happier, more productive workforce overall. I agree. I, I think, you know, keywords for me from all three of your answers, you know, intentionality, transparency, open communication. And I think the theme of 2020 exists. It's agility, right? It's going to be a different day yeah. every day, a different week. So really hearing what, you know, your staff, your team, your leaders, your, your company, you know, aligning on those goals and understanding that the job needs to get done, but how can we do it in a way that serves all of us? Um, I'd like to start taking questions for anybody that has questions, but Ciara has posed one um, to, for us. Um, the question is regarding the work teams we coach, it seems like while those of us at our career prime can be super efficient remotely and know how to show up, the younger generation, something, something is lost learning how to be professional when they're not moving amongst older professionals. Is the benefit of picking up on nonverbal communication, observing interactions? What are your thoughts? I was just talking about this yesterday <laughs> with people um, and it's going to maybe sound ironic, you know, here I am as an advocate of remote work, but um, you know, we have taken for granted how much you learn through osmosis, right? And the patterning that, you know, I mentioned it earlier, humans are social creatures and we pattern and mirror our behavior are off of other people, right? Um, and we learn what is acceptable, how to, what's our in intonation? How do I behave at a board meeting versus a meeting of my peers versus, um, you know, a customer meeting, those kinds of things are very difficult to learn. And I've actually observed um, in some, uh, you know, uh, of my own hiring situations where it's like, wow, this, this person, I don't think I could hire them for this role because they're not ready. I, and I don't necessarily yet know how to teach some of these things, right? remotely, right? Where they're not just picking them, them up. Um, I think the, the other side of this is that even in a, a real world in-person situation, there needs to be onboarding. You have to watch how much of what you're trying to explain is tacit versus explicit. And if you're just expecting your 22 year old just out of college, you know, or just out of code school or just out of wherever, um, employee to just figure it out, you are setting them up for failure, right? And you're probably setting your company up 
um, for some performance issues itself, right? Because you're not communicating clearly about what the expectations are. So literally you can say, you know, this is the dress code for this type of meeting. Um, this is how I, um, you know, adjust and modulate my voice for certain things. You know, I've actually given feedback around how are you answering questions and what is, you know, the appropriate time to have certain gravitas and others, other times where you don't need it um, because you're not able to hear that in, in the majority of our remote situations. Yeah, I feel very fortunate when I graduated from school, worked in an office with three women in between them had like 60 five years of, you know, corporate sales experience. And so you do, you pick up a lot from, you know, the person that you're, that is managing you, you pick up a lot during meetings and in a remote environment, you miss a lot of that. Doug, do you see that with your up and coming workforce that there may be kind of green in those respects? How do you kind of address that and support them and make them successful? Sure. Yeah. Well, you know, just the nature of our business, we, we bring in a lot of early career folks into our team. Um, and uh, I think it's the nature of our business. I mean, I kind of sometimes think of us as a graduate school. We're bringing in people with very, a lot of enthusiasm, but not a lot of experience. And so we kind of push them into that experience where the, the maybe, hopefully they'll stick around with us, but if not, they're going to go off into the workforce, it, you know, much more improved in terms of their ability to deal and manage and that sort of thing. But um, I kind of look at it the other way too, you know, maybe not necessarily specific to pandemic, but one of the things that I think that keeps us very vibrant and dynamic is that ability for us, you know, the old dogs to learn what's going on the, you know, with the, the early uh, career folks that are coming up through the organization, you know, cause we can, we could do whatever we want. We can make them as old fashioned as I am, you know, once they, as they start here in their first job, but we can't control the rest of the environment, the rest of the world, right? So um, what we're finding is we're always adapting to like, what are the, what are the young buyers? Um, how are they influencing their side of the transaction, right? Um, what are the folks that like at our clients that are, are emerging leaders and that transact themselves in a different way than, I, you know, I might've come through, you know, at a big aid accounting firm. Um, so what we try to be very careful to do is not necessarily say like, hey, we're going to indoctrinate you in a ways that like, you know, old dog, new puppy type of thing, but to also be very responsive to say, you know, what are you, what are you bringing that, that we don't know because we weren't at, you know, at Oregon State two years ago, like, you know, what are all those folks, you're that, that, that canary in the coal mine that's going to help advise us as to how are we going to interact with our future customers. Um, I, I find that one of the really cool, exciting, dynamic parts of the business. I like that spin, using you using them almost as a guinea pig to um, help understand how you know we can all learn, right? Right. Chris, I'd like to give you the option to answer this question, but Sheila has also specifically asked you a question about time tracking. Um, you may choose your own adventure here. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll take the time tracking question, but be okay. before I do, I'll just mention that, you know, when we look at the, the younger workforce that we have, uh, you know, coming into to our company, um, we found that the, because there isn't as much, you know, learning by osmosis, as, as Kristen was mentioning, that uh, direct feedback is, is really necessary. So one thing that we're looking for in the hiring process is coachability to some extent. Um, and, and people that are eager to, to learn and grow, I think is really, really important because um, when you can effectively give somebody like really direct feedback and they're excited and, and um, you then can see them implement the things that you're, you're coaching them on really effectively, that's, that's really exciting for us to, to see. So, uh, but it definitely does because they're not learning by osmosis, it takes more direct feedback. There's a couple of folks at our company and that every time after a meeting, call them afterwards and we say, okay, what went well? What did we do well? What could have we done better? And I have them do that for me and I do that for them as well. So that it's, it's, you know, reciprocal in the nature that when they see me make this mistake, they can call that out. And I say, yeah, totally. Let's, let's do it better next time and vice versa. So um, kind of to, to Doug's uh, comment on, on being able to, to learn from everybody in the organization. So, um, and then, you know, quickly on time tracking, I'm just reading the question here. Um, the technology that we used was, uh, is called Harvest. So uh, Harvest integrates with Asana, which is our uh, project management software, which is really great for, you know, tasks can, uh, can basically be, be measured in Harvest. It's really, really easy to go from task in Asana to recording it in our, our time tracking uh, software. 
Um, we organized, you know, all of the, I guess, the categories by client, by person, by job type, so we can, you know, slice and dice the data in lots of different ways, which is, uh, which has really been, you know, beneficial for us when we review, um, either on the week or the month, or or when we get together as a leadership team and talk about, hey, where are there more systemic, you know, issues that we can address. Um, and I think part of the question was on um, was on resistance. Um, you know, I was really specific on time tracking of why we were doing it and and the need for it and the business need for it. So um, that was really important to us that, hey, this isn't to try to measure you and say, are you working enough? It's to gain insights so that we can do better managing the business. If we see everybody from a certain team is totally maxed out and we hear it and we see it and we know it, we can go and look at hiring more resources for that team, right? If, if we don't have the data, it's a little bit more difficult. You're kind of um, depending on intuition. So it just puts more things, you know, concretely into, yes, we know it, we can act on it. Um, and we're also really careful not to, you know, judge people on time or, hey, you didn't log 40 hours this week. It's like, you're probably not going to because there's not 40 hours of, of uh, in a week that's actually a workable, measurable time. So, you know, we, we try not to make it about the individual, but how it can benefit the business as a whole. And uh, adoption has actually been, you know, we, we had to hammer on it for, you know, two, three, four weeks every week, reminding people. Managers had to remind their people, and it'll lag occasionally, but ultimately we've had really good adoption with it as people saw the action coming out of that information. That's great. Thank you so much. And um, I want to be cautious of those people um, attending and on the panel that you may have a, a meeting in a few moments, which um, I want to give you, you know, the opportunity to refresh, to use the restroom. And um, so I want to give you a, a few minutes back, but thank you for participating in this wonderful discussion. Um, thank you to all of our attendees who are able to um, join us. Um, I'll make sure to make the recording available to those who could not join us. And if there's additional questions, please feel free to send them my way. I'm hoping to host future editions of this um, same talk um, as we kind of navigate to the new normal and um, would love for any and all of you to join us. So thanks again for participating with us today. Thank you for your time. And I hope everyone has a great day. Thanks, Elaine. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.